Cool. Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to give a quick introduction to uh, paleoneurology. So paleoneurology as we know it today um, was founded in the late 19th century by Tilly Edinger. So Tilly Edinger was the daughter of um, German neurologist Ludwig Edinger, who was also the co-founder of the University of Frankfurt. Um, so she went on to get her PhD, um, recognizing that actually neurology and paleontology can be combined. Um, she moved to America after this during the Second World War, where she was the sole female member of the founding meeting of SVP, and she later became the first female president of SVP. Um, so these are a few of her books. So that one translates as The Fossil Brain, and there's a paleoneurology uh, anthology that she um, also wrote, but unfortunately was uh, published posthumously. So paleoneurology um, researchers believe that it can give an insight into behavior, so looking at the morphology of endocasts and brains. Um, and lots of people enjoy working on endocasts. Um, however, brain cases, the bones surrounding the brain, are relatively um, understudied, and generally it will be just a little section of an overarching kind of skull uh, description. This is mainly due to extreme fu uh, sutural fusion and... Um, also the fact that there's lots of horrible terminology associated with brain cases. Um, so this is heavily disputed, but it also some people believe that it also has the potential to identify cranial orientation using the um, kind of angle of the semicircular canals, but I'll talk more on that later. So obviously to, get an, uh, to be able to study internal structures, uh, we need to see, do, use CT scanning. Um, CT scanning is great, obviously, because it reduces the need for destructive methods. So um, this is a resin cast of a Triceratops brain case from the early 1900s. And obviously, to actually extract this, the skull would have had to be completely destroyed to, um, to actually access it. So CT scanning makes it uh, much easier. And also, CT scanning can provide a lot of detail, especially kind of micro CT scanning. Um, you can see very... Uh, it, good resolution kind of thing. And also post-editing um, means that kind of the digital editing after means that you can kind of use colors and it's very kind of reader friendly. So um, it's great for kind of publications. So I went to the IVPP in Beijing where I use their micro CT scanner to um, scan a few ceratopsian uh, skulls. And their CT scanner was a very high resolution and um, but the only issue is it can't really fit very large specimens like a medical CT scanner can. So size was definitely an issue. Um, I actually focused on Cytacosaurus lugertinensis. So this is Bob Nichols's lovely model. Um, so Cytacosaurus um, was a early Cretaceous uh, ceratopsian dinosaur um, from Asia. And it's an extremely <coughs> abundant fossil. So we have skulls, hundreds of skulls throughout the world in various institutions. Um, we also have um, some great ontogenetic sequences of Cetacosaurus. So we have um, nests as all the way through to, of hatchlings all the way through to um, fully grown adults. They're also very small for ceratopsians, so I think they grow to around uh, two meters maximum. So this is very important when using CT scanners. They're also a genus for which a postural shift has been posited. So um, Qi Zhao, one of my supervisors, did a histological study of the long bones and found that um, they developed from a quadrupedal juvenile to a bipedal adult. And uh, this change took place around four to five, when they were about around four to five years old. So once I got my scans from Beijing, I brought them back to Bristol and I segmented them in a viso. So this is the uh, kind of viso interface if uh, you haven't used it. And I segmented the eight bones that surround uh, the brain, uh, the actual brain. So these are all color coded so that um, it kind of fits in with the next few slides. Unfortunately, I can't really go through everything because that would take a long time. Um, so these are three of the, uh, of the skulls that I scanned. And um, so you have the tiny little hatchling on the left, the juvenile and the adult on the right. And the scale bar is uh, 20 millimeters. So the, the hatchling is very small. Uh, here's a better view of it. So the hatchling was actually under one year old and also has very good preservation. So it's pretty complete except for the nasals, which I think were uh, reconstructed in plaster uh, because when I scanned them, when I looked at the CT scans, there was nothing there. So um, that's fantastic. <laughs> and it was in fantastic preservation. Here's the, uh, here's the brain case that I segmented out. Um, 
and you can see the sutural boundaries, everything is just beautiful and it was a joy to segment, um, <laughs> unlike the juvenile. Now the juvenile was awful. It was around four years old and has kind of moderate preservation, so it's lacking a rostral and part of the kind of posterior part of the skull is a little bit crushed. Um, so you can see this kind of dog's breakfast of a CT uh, segmentation and you can see the, oh, sorry, the yellow um, exoccipitals or paracipital processes are incomplete as is the parietal. Um, but other than that, it's not too bad. There was some dorsoventral compression, um, but it was hideous to uh, segment because it was very well fused and the uh, deformation meant that the uh, sutural boundaries were pretty much obliterated. Um, finally, the adult. Um, so it was great, great um, preservation, only a little bit of deformation. And although it was uh, well fused because there was little deformation, the uh, sutural boundaries uh, were quite easy to see, so it wasn't too bad. Um, and you can see that actually there is a lot of difference between the original hatchling and this, um, this adult specimen. Um, so we were pretty lucky to be able to fit this in the, C in the micro CT scanner. It was kind of pushing the boundary, but uh, yeah, it was pretty good. So obviously working on an ontogenetic sequence is fantastic. It's a rare opportunity to look at the development of dinosaurs. And, um, you know, hatchling dinosaurs are, are extremely rare. You don't really know what you're going to find. And um, when we were segmenting the uh, frontals, we came across these two little ossicles. And they're kind of either, either side of the midline of the frontal. And uh, we have no idea what they are. I haven't been able to see those in any other <laughs> ceratopsian dinosaurs. Um, or anything else. We've talked to a number of ceratopsian workers and we're, quite, we're not quite sure what they are. So if anyone has any ideas, come and give me a chat after, chat to me after. Um, another thing that was interesting about the hatchling, the frontal of the hatchling, was that the um, cerebral hemispheres were very well defined. And this is quite rare for ornithischian dinosaurs. Um, generally, if you're going to find well defined cerebral hemispheres, it would be more kind of theropod dinosaurs. And there are also some other structures which suggested that um, the brain was actually in quite close contact to the, uh, to the actual bone. So that was also interesting. I can't say much more because my colleague's working on that. So hopefully that will be out in a paper soon. Um, so I then measured uh, all of the brain case elements and compared it to the basal skull length um, to get a kind of idea of rate of growth of these elements. And um, we found that um, elements towards the kind of front of the skull um, grew in an isometric fashion and towards the posterior of the skull uh, there was quite a few um, that grew kind of in an allometric fashion. So um, the most notable things were was the, um, the supraoccipital became really uh, tiny in the adult um, and the, uh, the paracipital processes flared really wide and long in the adult specimen. So um, that's probably to do with kind of muscle attachment sites and the uh, need for kind of uh, more of those as the kind of skull gets larger and the neck muscles uh, kind of get a bit bigger. So we also segmented the semicircular canals. So we have the, uh, the hatchling, the juvenile and the adult. And using uh, shell horns methods in his 2018 paper, um, we kind of looked at how the lateral semicircular canal um, fits with the kind of Earth's horizon. Now, this is heavily disputed. Lots of people say, you know, that might not be a sense, that might not be a way to find out the cranial orientation of, um, of extinct organisms. But it's interesting to see that there is some definite uh, differences here. And he, so Shellhorn looked at the same sort of thing, but with extant rhinos and found that... Um, the rhinos with the more downgraded skull were actually uh, feeding on grass and grazers, and the more horizontal skull kind of um, they were feeding on uh, kind of leaves and plants higher up. So maybe it has something to do with um, feeding strategies. I'm not too sure. It's just pure speculation for now. Um, but yeah, that was quite interesting to say. I thought. So where am I going to go with this next? Um, I'm going to look at the um, elements that have undergone little change uh, through growth and maybe remained isometric and explore it in a kind of phylogenetic context. Um, so ceratopsy and phylogenetics, they're kind of lacking brain case characters. So anything I can add there would be, would be of use. 
Um, I'm also working on uh, segmenting a baby ceratopsid um, brain case, and so hopefully that description will be published sometime next year, probably. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you to all my funders, and thanks to Muldoon. Thank you.